Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Well, today, that's good to be back again. It is good. It's a nice day to talk about church history. Not that any of them are. <laughs> I guess they all are for me. That's right. <laughs> so we've been um, just introducing ourselves to the earliest of early modern church history. Uh, we've been looking a little bit at the Avignon Papacy, which yes. uh, is an absolutely fascinating time. Uh, it, it's sort of a different way of doing church in the sense <laughs> that it wasn't in Rome, but you have to understand, but we always remember that Rome was very, very dangerous at that time. Right. And so it was not, um, it would not have been conducive to, to run church governance, uh, unfortunately, from uh, Italy at that point. And so Avignon uh, presented a, a, um, a more peaceful situation. And uh, so we'll be looking today at some incidences that happened. If you remember that the reason why the uh, the, conclave, the, uh, the conclave that elected Clement V elected him was because he was a friend of the King of France, right. and the hope was that he could use his personal diplomacy, which he had great skill at, as we'd seen last week mm-hmm. in different uh, other areas, to bring about a, uh, uh, well, to use a French term, a rapprochement between France and um, and the papacy. That was their hope, and uh, and that didn't always work out. And the most tragic example of that not working out is um, is the suppression of the Knights Templar, how that takes place, and the ineffectiveness of the uh, of the Pope in order to try to rectify that. Briefly. Um Instruct us again on the Knights Templar. I know that they yeah. were kind of started with the Crusades. Right? It is, yeah. It's it's a fascinating group of of men. Uh, they had organized back in the 1100s, okay. um, and they were known as the Order of the Poor Knights of the Temple of Solomon. Okay. Uh, hence the name, the Templars. Okay. And uh, their headquarters, in fact, was on the top of Temple Mount. Uh, they were the occupants of, of that some of the, of the most sacred soil in the world for three religions, both Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, both hold that uh, in, in great respect. That was their headquarters, and um, and of course today say, that same site now is the Temple Mount. And uh, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, is is the Dome of the Rock? Is the Islamic site. I was going to say, yeah, who, who has possession now? Yeah, okay. and, uh, yeah, that's right. And, and <clears throat> as I say, they were uh, religious soldiers. Uh, it, this seems very strange to us today how this would be, but it, but it was. Uh, these were men who dedicated their lives to protecting pilgrims on their wow. on the road from the Mediterranean at the port of Jaffa to Jerusalem, and they lived by the rule of Saint Augustine. So they lived oh, as, as like though that. they were Augustinians. Okay. They had uh, monks, uh, they had priests um, in, in this order. Uh, they were not allowed to fight. Uh, the other monks uh, who were soldiers, uh, that's what they did. So if you could imagine that, that in, th- in the monasteries all throughout Europe, you'd have some monks who were bakers and others who mm-hmm. were who were um, uh, brew ma- masters mm-hmm. and others uh, had vineyards and and others took care of sheep, and well, these particular men, they fought. They were uh, knights, and yet monks at the same time. Because it was difficult tra- travel oh, through there. It was dangerous. There's mm-hmm. no doubt about it. And remember that after the First and Second Crusades that um, you have a kingdom, uh, a Western kingdom, a Latin kingdom established in what is today uh, the Holy Land. And, uh, in fact, there was a king appointed uh to rule over that King Baldwin, and he certainly uh, welcomed the uh, the Knights Templar as an important element for the defense of um, of that area. This was a lawless area, also. Uh, go ahead. Didn't they also serve some treasury? 
Okay. Yes, yes, they did. Uh, besides the the military uh, work that they did, um, they also they sort of backed into this. And here's a situation in which they uh, the Knights Templar had houses all over Europe. Okay. Now these are armed knights, mm -hmm. so their houses are safe. Safe houses. <laughs> yeah, right. But well, they were safe not so much for people as much as for money. Oh, what okay. you did was Come if you safe. were <laughs> yeah, thanks. If you were traveling, for instance, let's say you were a merchant and, and you were traveling from um, from Paris and you were going to Cairo or Damascus. Damascus would be a good example. And uh, you wanted to go to Damascus in order to buy, I don't know, Persian rugs. Okay. Okay. It would be not safe for you to travel from Paris all throughout Europe waking your way all the way to Damascus, carrying all that money. Mm -hmm. So what you would do is you would go to a Knights Templar uh, monastery. You would give them the cash, and then they would write a note saying to the, um, the knights at this other particular uh, place, headquarters, that you had given so much money to them, and then they would give you that money. It's, it's the beginnings, really, of, of what we call... Banking or commercial paper. Oh, okay. You know, uh -huh, sure. uh, checks. And so that's what you would do. You would travel to this other place. Well, if you were way late along the way and somebody, you know, said, give me your, you know, your money or your life, you go, I don't have any money. I just have this note from the Knights Temple. And they go, well, that's no good. Move. Get out of here. And then they would go after somebody else that had some wealth. So you could get to Damascus, get your money, and then go buy your goods. So it, it made uh, life easier. In the process of all of this, of course, the knights then had the money in order to use. And then another thing, too, is a lot of people were very uh, grateful for the service that the knights gave, certainly as far as uh, protection, mm -hmm. but, but also there are other services throughout, uh, throughout Europe. And so often people would give bequests uh, oh, okay. to the knights. And so over a period of time, the knights had a lot of money in order to do their particular ministry. Okay. You know, and, and, and so they became quite, uh, quite wealthy. And there were people who were jealous of that. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, there were a lot of bishops who were jealous of it because, uh, for two reasons. First of all, they were a papal order protected directly by the Pope. Okay. And their service was directly to the Pope. And so the bishop, if, if you had a, a monastery with the Knights Templar uh, headquarters in your diocese, you had no control over that, diocese, that, that, that property. They would um, have every right to raise money, have capital campaigns in your diocese, mm -hmm. that, of course, would make your own diocese poorer for mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And so that that element of, of independence uh, did not endear them to the knights or even to other uh, monasteries. And, and then, of course, as I see, uh, they were rich pickings for a ruthless king. And don't we have a ruthless king at this time? You right. know, Philip the Fourth, mm -hmm. Philip the Unfair, <laughs> fair by complexion, unfair in the way he, he went around doing things. And and so uh, Philip, if you remember, at the installation of um, at the ceremonies of the installation of Pope Clement the Fifth, he kind of um, throws a, a dead fish into the whole ceremonies by taking the Pope aside and telling him, by the way. I've got evidence that the Knights Templars um, are a heretical group and they are practicing black masses and, and all kinds of things. Well, of course, none of that's true. And the Pope was shocked. And so I just can't believe that. And the king says, well, let me tell you. you know, and, and so here you have this, this kind of standoff. All of a sudden then, in uh, 1307, one dark and stormy night, the uh, the French la launched an attack that was set up by the Chancellor of France, Guillaume de Nogaret, who we've seen before. Mm -hmm. you know, this is the guy that really uh, roughed up and led to the death of Pope uh, Boniface VIII. Well, this fellow launches an attack on, on the houses, especially in Paris, but all the houses of the Knights Templar, and disarms them overnight. It's done on October the 13th. It happens to be a Friday. And uh, <laughs> from thereafter, Friday the 13th has just never been a, hmm. a, uh, a lucky day. 
massive arrests all throughout France. Something like 50, possibly as many as 100 knights were rounded up. And they included the general, the grand master of, of the order, uh, Jacques de Molay. Uh, there's some really interesting books, if, if people want to read more on this. Um, one of them I would really highly recommend is uh, called The Knights Templar and Their Myth. And I'm going to quote this a little bit later on. This is uh, Peter Parkner. And Peter Partner has done some really good work on the Knights Templar and also on the myth that grows into what is Freemasonry. Oh, mm-hmm. Okay. The other one that is uh, not so much, uh, it is, is not as good a history, but it is really intriguing and just really a fun read is called Dungeon, Fire, and Sword. Okay. And the subtitle is The Knights Templar and the Crusades, but it also talks about the, uh, the suppression. And the author of this is uh, John J. Robinson. Okay. Okay. But I would really, if you want to read some, if you want to read something entertaining uh, and, and, and engaging, read Robinson. Uh-huh. But if you really want the scoop the on truth. what really, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Not that I guess. yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, the, the um, straight, you know, the, mm-hmm. the skinny More on the historical. On what yeah, I, uh, you would get a hold of Peter Partner okay. and, and read his, and he's got a couple other books out too. But this is uh, so. This is this event that takes place on Friday the thirteenth of, <laughs> of thirteen oh seven with the arrest of uh, of these knights. In fact, Clement at, at later on says that he believed as many as 2,000 knights were arrested in France alone. That's probably an, an exaggeration. Uh, there might have been 2,000 knights in France at the time, but certainly the first sweep uh, took out the leadership. Mm-hmm. That, that was the intention to do that. The Templars should have been protected by Pope Clement. You know, he, he should have... Um, challenged the king right then and there. Mm -hmm. But remember, we're dealing with a diplomat, with a a diplomatic um, uh, mindset and personality. And so instead of confronting and challenging, which of course is a sort of a a, a Boniface VIII kind of an approach, instead he looks for ways of nuances and and negotiations and and all of those, uh, those sorts of things. The chancellor... Um, Guillaume de Nogeret finds a, a traitor, finds an ex-knight who is willing to come up and, and, and spill the beans on these guys. His name is Esquin de Florian, and uh, as I say, he's an ex-knight. He had left the Knights of, of the Templar of the Temple, and he uh, appears before court and argues that um, that. He had been forced into demon worship, uh, that their worship includes the denial of Christ, and, uh, and, and that the Knights Templar were full of homosexual practices. Uh, one of the things that most uh, historians of the period point out is that uh, the accusation of homosexual practices is boilerplate. Just throw it on everything. Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. uh, if you want to discredit somebody, you say that whether it's true or not. Right. Whether any of this is true or not is very doubtful. Uh, Florian is the only one who makes these accusations. He has a good reason to grind an axe personally, uh, plus the fact that he's working for the king now. <laughs> so I wouldn't exactly call him an unbiased witness, you know. He uh, presents this evidence, or the evidence is presented to Pope Clement the sixth, uh, the, the fifth, rather, and he finds it absolutely incredulous. But uh, helping to convince the Pope is a small French army that arrives on his door to quote unquote protect him. Mm. Uh, so it's it's a, it's a <laughs> little difficult. Now what what happens now is uh, a, a total aberration of of the custom. The, the, the proper order of an inquiry is that the Pope should call together the inquiry. He himself should uh, have the, the court, uh, now here stationed at Avignon, go through an inquisition. And I mean that with a small I. Mm-hmm. It is literally an inquiry, uh, a grand jury. That's mm-hmm. what we would call it today, a grand jury, to see whether or not there is uh, any truth to the accusations. If it's believed that there is truth to the accusations, then there would be a conviction. And at that point, the um, men would be then turned over to the secular authority. And at that time, they would undergo a, a trial. But it's not the kind of trial we think of. 
it is a trial of pain mm. in order to determine whether or not uh, people are telling the truth or not. And, and what happens then is that there's torture involved. Uh, the secular government is doing not the church, but the secular mm. government is doing this. If you persevere in your torture, um, it is a sign that, that God has given you the strength and you're, you are, you are uh, proclaiming the truth in your innocence. If you confess to the crime, then the truth has been told. And uh, so then you're punished. If, on the other hand, um, you confess and then afterwards, seeing your punishment, deny your, your confession and again proclaim your innocence, well, that means you're a relapse and you get burned at the stake. Oh, my gosh. There's yeah. not much win here, is there? No, there isn't. Uh, and, and that is the fair way to deal with people. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad a few things have changed. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's for sure. We can certainly be proud of our own system. As yeah, broad right. as it is, yeah. it's better than that. Well, Philip takes the system, turns it upside down, and makes it even worse. Oh, he doesn't turn it over he's to so fair. well, that's right. Yeah, doesn't turn it over to a grand jury or the papal inquisition. Instead, what he does is he takes these knights and he tortures them right from the very beginning, the get go, and then takes the confessions that, that come out of the torture, turns it over to the papal inquiry as evidence. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's absolutely backwards. <laughs> you know, Clement himself um, is is outraged by this, but at the same time, there's not a heck of a lot that he's going to be able to do about it. You know, he's kind of caught, in, and 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 this argument goes back for almost a month. Uh, what makes it all the more difficult is that the chief negotiator for the French for the for the king is Guillaume de Nogere, who had been excommunicated by the previous pope and had never been restored and so he couldn't speak to the pope directly so that just makes it a little bit more complicated finally after after all of this uh on the 22nd of november now there's, there's been over a month of, of wrangling that's gone back and forth finally clement uh promulgates a, a letter to the christian world in which um, he praises Philip for having routed out heresy. Now, whether he believed that or not is really doubtful. Why he did it is really doubtful, too. It might be that he was trying to win the release of the Knights Templar mm -hmm. by mollifying the king. I don't know. Or maybe he just was a wuss. I don't know. But uh, you know, it's, not just, it's just not real clear what his motivation was. But the fact is that, that he, uh, he did it. Mm -hmm. And then he called on uh, the arrest of, of Knights Templar all throughout the, the Christian world. And uh, various things uh, take place. It, 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 there's not a uniform pattern that takes place. Uh, throughout the Papal States and Italy itself, they are turned over to the Inquisition. Um, in, in most cases, they are tortured, and, um, and then they're either found guilty or not guilty according to what comes up with the, the torture. In some cases, uh, they're simply, uh, the, the Papal order is ignored, in England, the King of England, uh, Edward II, uh, his nickname is Longshanks. Uh, he was famous in that uh, that film about um, oh, Scotland. Do you remember a couple oh, of years ago? Uh, Braveheart. Braveheart. Mm -hmm. Braveheart. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Philip II uh, has Knights Templar in his employment and under his protection, and he protects the knights. He, he will not turn them over. He sends word over to the Pope and says, England has no torturers. We, we simply don't have anybody that's skilled in doing this. And so uh, the Pope says, don't worry about it. I'll send you some papal oh, no. torturers. And uh, Edward says, okay, that would be fine, but they can't use torture. <laughs> well, English law, you know. And in, in Germany, uh, the Knights Templars were rounded up and were uh, uh, un, un, underwent a trial, and they were all found to be innocent. And so none of them were um, uh, were punished in, in Germany. In Spain and in Portugal, 
uh, word came back to Avignon saying, these guys are needed. I mean, we're in the process of reconquering the Iberian Peninsula for Christianity, and we can't spare anybody, so no way. And so they simply ignored the orders also. Uh, in Scotland, uh, you also have Knights Templar there, William Wallace, Robert Bruce. They also protect the Knights, and in that case, uh, both of them were excommunicated. Uh, at least for a while, because of their uh, their denying that. The question is, uh, is 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 fomenting throughout all of Europe, and this goes on for a, a couple years. And finally, in, in 1310, uh, Clement then calls the Council of Vienne. Okay. And it's it's basically to call for a crusade, which never takes place. Mm -hmm. But the real issue that it was on everybody's mind was the the Templars themselves. Now Vienna is in France, and uh, and so bishops and cardinals gathered from all over, and it became very obvious right from the very beginning that the bishops wanted a strong united stand concerning the Knights Templar, and that the Knights would be um, uh, set free. Uh, the, the fear among many of these bishops is if you can do this to the Knights Templar who are protected by the Pope, you could do it to me, mm -hmm. you know. And, and so obviously the entire policy that had been set in motion by the conclave that elected uh, Clement had not been fulfilled. They were not able to bring around this, this rapprochement with this, uh, this, this king who was greedy and, and, uh, and, and with, without any morals. You know, so you have that situation. Robinson says that in the midst of all of this, a very interesting thing happens. Um, in the middle of the council itself, seven fully armored uh, Knights Templar rode into the council oh. and disrupted the entire council. They were uh, arrested uh, by the papal uh, guards temporarily, and then had to. Um, then they were uh, released. Okay. Okay. Um, eventually, a, a deal is made with um, with uh, uh, King Philip the Fourth, and and the deal is that he could go forward with the suppression of the knights, if he himself dropped his own attacks on Pope Boniface VIII. Even after the death of Boniface VIII, his propagandists were still out there doing all kinds of stuff to, uh, uh, to um, slash the reputation of this, of this previous pope, and as a result of that, also to uh, slash the, um, the reputation of the papacy. Oh, mm -hmm. And so th that's the deal that, that's been worked out. However... In uh, in 1348, in uh, in March of 1348, the king finally decided to make the last final step and actually kill the um, the general, the master of the uh, Knights Templar. And so, on the 18th of March of uh, 1348, he gathers together an assembly out in front of the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. There's a, there's a big um, park sort of area it's a big plaza there and he and he brings uh, these men out to and and he sets fires he sets uh sets them to be to burned at the at the stake um it was incredibly cruel the way that that you normally burn someone at the stake it was what's called using a stick fire you take kindling wood mm -hmm. and and you surround the uh the the, uh, the person with the kindling wood, and then you light it, and mm -hmm. what happens no. is it 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 goes very very fast. It's a very fast, uh, and and it, what it does is as it's going up, it uh, it denies the person oxygen, and so within a minute or so, uh, the, uh, the the person will die, and and generally speaking, they'll they'll die feeling the flames. But uh, but they're going to die of suffocation more than anything, more than anything else. Um, on the other hand, what what uh, Philip does is he uses charcoal. Now charcoal is very expensive back then because it has to be processed. And um, I mean you know it's, think of it it's like briquettes. Mm -hmm. And what does it do? It puts out a steady constant slow heat. Yes, yeah, slow heat. And so these two men. Are, are being literally barbecued to death in front of the Notre Dame Cathedral 
You know, it was a it was an incredibly cruel thing to do. And at the same time, it was a very stupid thing to do because it meant that they did not suffocate within a minute or a minute and a half. Instead, they had several minutes in order to make speeches. Oh, and this is exactly what they did. Now, there are two men there. One of them was uh, Jacques de Molay. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's the, the master of the, uh, the grand master of the Knights Templar. And also another, an, another knight uh, who was an assistant of, of his. His name is Geoffrey de Charnay. And both of these men had plenty of opportunity then to um, make speeches. Of course, there's a crowd there of hundreds of Parisians to listen to this. It is not what the king had intended. The final words of Jacques de Molay are these. He invited the king of France and the pope to join him in death within one year. At that, he died. One month later, Pope Clement died. Oh, wow. Eight months later, Philip died. <clears throat> Thus is born a myth. Mm-hmm. You know, the, uh, the story also continues that, wow. that the, uh, the charred remains of both of these knights were taken and thrown into the Seine River. You know, that the, uh, mm-hmm. the Notre Dame is on, a, mm-hmm. on an island in, in, uh, in the middle of the Seine. They, they were thrown into the Seine River, and, and the story goes that hundreds of people jumped into the river, swam out, and grabbed pieces of these charred bodies as relics. Relics. Uh-huh. Yeah. And that's something. That is incredible. Yeah. Well, um, that's pretty much the end of that story, or it would seem to be. And, and what happens is that, and this is uh, really Peter Partner's his book, is that uh, what he does is he shows that this myth lays dormant for over 300 years. And just nobody's paying much attention to it. It's a very unfortunate moment in church history, all that. And then some 358 years after the, the burning of Jacques de Molay and the knight Geoffrey de Charnay, um, there is a new interest that grows up, not around the knights themselves, but around chivalry. And it has to do with the publication of a book in 1672. And uh, it, it's, uh, the, the book itself is written by Elias Ashmore. The title of it is Institutions, Laws, and Ceremonies of the Most Noble Order of the Garter. Okay. Pretty esoteric. Uh-huh. You know? uh, he's one of the founding members of the Royal Society of, uh, of London. And the deal is behind this book, and the reason why it's so popular, is that it touches the nostalgia that comes up in the, the mid and, and latter part of the 1600s, the 17th century. There's sort of a, a new nostalgia for knightliness, uh, the, the chivalry, the brotherhood of these knights, that fraternity of knights, um, the, the code to live by, the, the way people dress, you know, all those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Every once in a while, there are these, these moments of those romantic, mm-hmm. uh, in, in the you know, capital R sense, romantic uh, movements within uh, Western culture. And, uh, and this is one of those that kind of just uh, comes up in the middle of all of that. And so the story itself finds itself being fanned and and the story is whipped up once again by people like like Ashmore uh, who's just a really interesting character not only is he a scholar and something of an historian but he's also a a, a chemist an experimental chemist as well as an alchemist okay you know sort of a real interesting kind of a character and so this was real grist for his mill <laughs> to do this now if you take what what he's doing over in England and go back over to France this is also the time of Louis the 14th okay okay he is establishing a, uh, a united country that is centered on his government, and his government is centered on him. Um, and, and what he does is he hires in, besides all kinds of other people, you have to remember that Versailles, the, yeah. the palace at Versailles, can accommodate 10,000 guests. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. 10,000. 10,000. Um, and, and so he has this very large entourage and some of them actually worked 
<laughs> not many, but some of them were. And two of those who uh, were workers <laughs> were uh, court historians for France. And uh, they were D- the uh, Dupuy brothers. One of them is Pierre and the other one is Jacques. And, um, and, and these two guys spent their lives st- working in the archives of the French government and uh, putting together a history of France and particularly this era that takes place with Philip the, um, the Fair. Now, what they do is they rehabilitate the reputation of Philip the Fair. Everyone who knows this man knows that he was a... He was greedy and and immoral and and had no bounds and, and lawless, all this sort of stuff. But what they do is is they begin writing a history of Philip the Fair that makes him look good. Okay. Now, if they're if if he looks good, then who looks bad? Uh huh. I mean, it has to be Clement. Uh huh. You know, and so they're writing a history really that gives the impression that that the poor this poor king was manipulated by this really wily uh, a pope. What well, it's the absolute opposite of of what would, what was going on. But this is the 1600s. This is the 1600s. Okay. Yeah. So there they are, and they're publishing all of this kind of stuff. So there's a new interest in the Knights Templar. There's a new interest in the era of, of Philip the Fourth. Um, there's an interest in, in knightly ways, and all of these sorts of things. Okay, add into that the kind of a, a bizarre twist of the Enlightenment era. As you're going into the 1600s and 1700s, late 1600s and 1700s, people are turning to reason, to science. You know, these are the, this is the age of great scientific discoveries and all this. There is this uh, whole group of, of, um, of, of people, men and women, uh, who pride themselves as philosophs. They're philosophers. You, you know the names Montague and uh, oh. uh, um, you know, Montague, um, uh, Rousseau, Voltaire, Diderot, you okay. can go on and on, mm-hmm. and uh, Montaigne, rather. And, and, and so these, these men then are writing, um, uh, advocating reason, criticizing tradition, criticizing uh, revelation, criticizing religions that, that rely on revelation. There's a real reason snobbery that's, that's going around among the, the culture elite of the day. You know, the search for scientific precision. This is the age when, you know, with Diderot, the writing of the first encyclopedia, where he goes around and he tries to find all the people who um, know the most about one little item, has them write an article on it, and then puts it all in alphabetical order. It's kind of a brilliant idea, really. And, uh, and, and But the idea was to gather together all human knowledge, you know. And and so in the midst of all of this, there's, there's a re- rejection of religion and ritual and mystery and those. But here's the bizarre twist. These same guys who all day long are professing this at night like to get all dressed up in these funny looking hats mm-hmm. and give each other these strange uh, handshakes okay. and incantation words. And, you know, you got the, the candles and and the symbols. In other words, they're inventing their own ritual, mm-hmm. you know, as, as, they're, as they're sort of going along. They tend to be upper middle class and aristocrats. And they've got the leisure time to, to play with these games. In the midst of this incredible cauldron of an interest in, in chivalry, in uh, a, a rewriting of the history of that period, in um, the scientific um, sterility of the daily life, then uh, mirrored by this kind of strange mysticism at night. Okay. You add all of that, you, you pull in a very strange individual, a Scotsman. He's a, a Jacobite Scotsman, so he had, he had been supporting King James of England, um, who was unsuccessful in maintaining the throne. In uh, 1736, he uh, goes over to France, and he becomes known uh, among the French as Chevalier, or the knight, Sir uh, Ramsay. Chevalier Ramsay plays a very important role in the establishment of this, this um, Masonic myth. Okay. And, and in 1736, he gives a speech to these 
night guys, you mm-hmm. know, these, these, um, these night masons. And it's a wild creation, but it, it really catches people's imagination. It goes like this. Supposedly, in the most ancient of times, that there were great architects who had learned from the ultimate architect, who is God. And certain secrets were passed on among the Mesopotamians and among the Egyptians. Okay? There's this wisdom. And in their architecture, they, they express the wisdom of the cosmos by creating a microcosm in their temples and in their pyramids. Okay? Okay. Now, what happens as the story goes on, what ha- and of course they create these, these great, you know, uh, you know, the Tower of Babel, the, uh, the great pyramids and all of these, you know, the temples and all that. Now, the story goes on that at one point, the, uh, the Hebrews came into Egypt. They, they, where, where did they come from? Mesopotamia. They came into Egypt. So they're coming in contact with these most ancient of peoples. And they learned, the, uh, the patriarchs of, of the Hebrews learned the uh, secrets of the universe. And so with that, they, after they left Egypt, they carried Moses... Uh, who was identified with the Egyptians anyway, right. and and they uh, they carried that back to the Holy Land. Eventually, they will build their own temple, and this will be the um, the most important temple, of course, uh, of the Hebrews, the Jerusalem Temple, and it'll be built by King Solomon, who is of course known for um, wisdom. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there, there you have that part. Okay. Now Ramsey continues on. So you've got the this um, story going. Yeah, it is. It's a great story. And and the thing is, what makes it so great is it's based on a lot of really good half truths. Mm -hmm. Sure. So what he then argues is, and very reasonably, that the Temple of Solomon is a microcosm of the macrocosmos. Okay. So. The temple, which is on the Temple Mount, yeah, uh-huh. right? Okay, is uh, if you look at that temple and you understand that temple, you understand the wisdom of the universe, and the universe itself is nothing less than a, a, the temple of God. Okay. Okay. As is shown in the model, in his model, which is the there. temple. Mm-hmm. Now, remember that the first temple of Solomon is destroyed. Right. There's another temple built by the priests Ezra and Nehemiah. That temple is then um, supplanted by what's called the second temple, which is the one built by Herod the Great. Mm-hmm. Right. That's destroyed in 70 A.D. during the siege of Jerusalem. Okay, now there's nothing there. It's just the Temple Mount and ruins, not a stone upon a stone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got all of that. And it stays that way for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, for a thousand years. And then what happens? Along come the Crusaders. These knights, these great Crusaders, come in, take over the Holy Land. And, of course, one of those orders of knights then is, um, is... given as headquarters the temple grounds. Okay. And who are they? The Knights Templar. Mm-hmm. The story then continues on that the Knights Templar learned from the ruins of the temple the esoteric knowledge of the entire universe. And so wow, they became they masters of the knowledge. Okay? That made them rivals. Oh. To whom? The Catholic Church. Oh, okay. And therefore, in the 1300s, the Catholic Church suppressed the Knights Templar with the aid of good King Philip, you know. And so they suppressed the Knights Templar in order to keep the truth from coming out, Mm -hmm. to keep the enlightenment, the enlightenment of mankind from coming out, so that superstition and ignorance could prevail. And... Ramsey then would argue that for hundreds of years, the, the mysteries of the Knights Templar remained locked away. And through Freemasonry, 
is being revealed. Discovered. Yeah, but you can't let it out to everybody. No. You know, you gotta, you gotta kind of share it Privileged amongst the information. Sure, that's right. And the culture elite are the ones that are going to. Uh, the only ones going to understand that, I'm sure. I, I, that's exactly right. So there you have it. You know that, it, and it, and it, uh, it just uh, it is very popular among so many of these Enlightenment characters uh, to do this kind of a thing. In um, Examples of this, I mean, get right down into some of our classic literature and, class, uh, and, and uh, classic music. The magic flute that, that yeah. is uh, Mozart, Mozart's own work, is in, in fact full of all kinds of Masonic uh, imagery. Wow, I yeah, didn't realize that. Very interesting. That. Um, if you look at the United States dollar, yes. it has all kinds of Masonic imagery on it. Um, what happens then is that it doesn't. This, this doesn't stay idle. In the 1740s, and 50s, and, and so forth, um, it, it, uh, the the myth itself morphs in, in various ways. And the next real development, according to uh, Peter Partner, um, it takes place in 1760 in Germany with two collaborators. There's a French POW um, by the name of George Frederick Johnson. Okay. Uh, that sounds like a strange combination of names, but mm-hmm. remember that Europe in the 1700s was actually much more cosmopolitan than it had been for the next couple hundred years. Um, it just George Frederick Johnson meets up with a minister by the name of Pastor Samuel Rosa. And the two of them come up with was something that can't be called anything other than a Templarist scam. Okay. Now, okay. how they do this is they have what they call grades of of vengeance. So that when you first enter into their under their group of um, of um, uh, of Masons, mm-hmm. okay, they um, they first of all uh, you, you make a, a, a promise to um, to avenge the Knights Templar in some strange kind of a way. Okay. Then it goes a little bit further. The second grade goes a little bit further. The third grade goes further. And eventually you are then condemning our uh, promising vengeance on ultimately uh, upon the Pope and the Catholic Church and all of that. But that happens over time. You enter into, you're given little bits of esoteric knowledge uh, at each one of these grades. But to enter into each one of these grades means that you, well, you have to have a new sword. And, uh, you know, so you have to buy a new sword and, and you have to have a different uniform and, uh, you know, a, a new kind of turban with a, a, little, a little whirly bird on the top or whatever, you know. <laughs> uh-huh. and, and so, and of course, where do you buy those things? Where do you get those things? You get them from these two guys. Sure. Then every time you make that grade, you then put on a banquet for all your brothers. Oh. <laughs> you know? And uh, so you go through the admission ceremonies and you pay for a banquet. Well, these guys are just having a grand old time, mm-hmm. you know, because they've got characters all over the place that are willing to make these um, these sacrifices and and continue on all of this goes on um, and e- eventually you're going to have uh, another real organization by a, a once again a, a German entrepreneur who picks up on Johnson and Rosa mm-hmm. and carries it even further and his, his name is Carl Gotthelf von Hund and in the 1770s, he takes this thing to a fine pyramid scheme. Okay. So that what he's doing is he's convincing other members of the lodges mm-hmm. to go out and recruit other members, and they get a certain percentage. Mm-hmm. Get the idea? Sure. And it just goes on and on and on like that. Ultimately, he's arrested for his activities. He's uh, <laughs> sent off to do time in Wartsburg Castle. You familiar with Bosford Castle? No. It's the that one. It doesn't sound like a bad place. Well, it's the one that Martin Luther had spent time at when he was hiding out from Charles V, the emperor, okay. in preparation to return back to Wittenberg. So that okay. castle has had some interesting history in it. So 250 years after Luther's visit, uh, von Huyn ends up uh, there instead. 
He's a, a wealthy landowner in, or had been until he ended up in prison, a wealthy <laughs> landowner in, in Saxony, in uh, an area of eastern Germany. And he's backed by various dukes and, and lords and, and all of these sorts of things. Um, in 1772, he had even gotten a conference, a European-wide conference set up of quote-unquote Templars that came together. These guys are claiming to be spiritual descendants of the Knights Templar. And a bunch of them show up in Prussia for this uh, this big confab. Isn't that incredible? That is incredible. Yeah. 1770 or 1785, um, by that time, you have a whole other movement that's underway. It's called the um, the Illuminati, uh -huh. the Illumin illuminated ones or the illumined ones. And in Bavaria, uh, it gets to be so dangerous in the government that the government actually suppresses it. This is 1785. It's actually suppressed. It causes uh, widespread condemnation of the Bavarian government. There are many people that, that condemn the, the Bavarians for doing that. Even one fellow over here in the newly formed United States of America by the name of George Washington mm -hmm. wrote a letter condemning the Bavarian government for condemning the Illuminati. Wow. He himself, of course, was a Mason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Four years later, the French Revolution takes place. And there's a lot of question as to whether or not um, Templarism or the Illuminati or Freemasonry had anything to do with the French Revolution. And we don't find a smoking gun here. It's not a real clear evidence. Uh, but on the other hand, many of the revolutionaries themselves have Masonic backgrounds. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, Prince Talleyrand, um, who had been a foreign minister both during the revolutionary period and later on was the chief negotiator for, um, for Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, Talleyrand himself... Uh, well, I, we, we've got to be truthful about this. He had been a bishop. Okay. Uh, and not only that, uh, as we'll see later on as we talk about the French Revolution and the Catholic Church, um, he had also been a very active member of, of the Masons. Mm. Uh, the ideals of, of Masonry, um, as they're expressed in their own literature, often have the same vocabulary as the ideals of the French Revolution. Okay. The, um, the real impetus be t behind the French Revolution really are a whole bunch of clubs throughout France called the Jacobin Clubs. And uh, there is the, at least some evidence that, that these clubs are called Jacobin because they were first, they first met at the uh, Monastery of St. Ja uh, James. Okay? And, uh, but, but there's a relationship between those groups meeting there and, um, and uh, Freemason groups that are also meeting at the same time. Uh, you have the storming of the Bastille, the murder of the king, the terror that follows afterwards and all of this. And um, all of this can be seen as a Templar fulfillment of the of the vengeance of um, of uh, the Templars of Jacques de Molay against the um, uh, the monarchy for for the murder of de Molay. Of course, we know that today the, uh, the de Molay has a very special name among uh, Masons. And um, he's, he's held in high regard as this myth is carried on. One of the interesting things, I want to say something about Templarism today, but before I say that, uh, one of our seminarians is, is currently working on a master's degree. Uh, and, and his topic is, uh, the chosen topic that he has, is the, the evolution of discord between the Catholic Church and Freemasonry. And as he's looking at that, he also had to find the, the, the actual historical um, origins of, of Masons. And he's come up with some very interesting ideas. Evidently, they're available on the, on the web. It's not, it's not any secret. But there are two kinds of approaches to Masons. Okay. And one is the, the English approach or the British approach, and the other, historically looking at it, and the other is the, um, the French approach. The French approach really comes from um, Ramsey, Chevalier Ramsey. Mm -hmm. This approach buys hook, line, and sinker, the mythology that was invented by Ramsey, uh, the, the historical backgrounds that go back to the Knights Templar, the de Molays, all this sort of stuff, and, uh, and, and all the various degrees that, that you belong, you know, the 30-something degrees. 
The English uh, Masons, on the other hand, find their history, they trace their history back to actual masonry, the building of buildings. Okay, wait a minute. Who, who followed Ramsey then? Ramsey is going to be, it's called, the, that's the French. That's the group. French. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. I had it backwards. And then today, here in the United States, we would see that particularly among the Scottish Rites. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the English Masons are much simpler. They've got only two or three, uh, three or four degrees. And uh, their historic origins are actually grounded in the establishment of, of Masons in the Middle Ages. Remember that in the Middle Ages, we, they didn't have unions, but they had guilds. Right. And so, if you're a cobbler, okay, that'd be one thing, or a... Uh, uh, a book scribe or something like that would be another. But in this case, um, they are um, they're masons. They build buildings, okay, okay. particularly churches. Okay. And so uh, it's out of that guild that is then formed a social club because after by the time of the Protestant Reformation, guess what? They weren't building churches anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, cathedrals simply mm -hmm. weren't being built anymore, and so they found themselves building other things. But they banded together as a social organization as well as a, uh, an economic organization, and so you have um, the, that kind of masonry that continues on down today. Those are two very different understandings of the history of, of uh, masonry. But it's the Templarism that, that is perhaps most interesting for our story because of the, the myth that, that, that uh, goes all the way back to the time of the suppression of the Knights Templar, which was, in fact, an actual Catholic order right. of mm -hmm. soldiers and, and monks. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd just like to uh, end, perhaps, with this quote from uh, Peter Partner as he ends his own book, on, on that. He says, he says the following. It's kind of sad. He says, The unromantic truth is that the Templars of the Middle Ages made not the slightest attempt to build a temple of wisdom unless that temple is defined as that of the Catholic Church. The end of the Templars arose not from the operation of demonic forces, but as the result of their own mediocrity and lack of nerve. A handful of them measured up to the terrible challenge which confronted them. But most, including their leaders, at the moment of trial, proved to have nothing much to say. In the Holy Land, the Templars had been brave soldiers, but rather short-sighted politicians, who in no way conformed to the high standards of their 19th century admirers ascribed to them. The most striking characteristic of the medieval Templars was their ordinariness. They represented the common man and not the uncommon visionary. Mozart's noble Masonic opera, The Magic Flute, holds out the vision of a temple of reason and of nature presented over by the ruler, seer, Sarastro. If the temple of Sarastro is ever to be built and if man is to live in some state of Mozartian harmony, it may be on principles in which the Freemason ideal has had a part, but it is not based on the ideals of the medieval Templars. He separates myth from reality there. Mm -hmm. Another um, uh, good uh, little thing to pick up, too, is a tract by, uh, by Pope Leo XIII on Freemasonry, um, Humanum Janus, uh, talks about the in. in compatibility of the Masonic ideal and the teachings of the Catholic Church. All right, Father, that is another wonderful show today, but I've, I've always been fascinated by the Templar, so I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to have to pick up one of those books and read it. Would yeah. you give us a brief look at next week's show? Yeah, um, next week we're going to go back to the pontificate of John the 22nd okay. and look at some of the challenges that he had, and particularly with the development of, of various heresies at the time uh, that he had to deal with the um, the uh, Albigensians. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, there's another group called the Poor Men of Lyon. Okay. Um, this was led by uh, Peter Waldo and the Waldensians. Uh, you have some really weird groups um, like the the Flagellants that go around beating themselves and, and this kind of thing. He had a lot to deal with. And, and if that wasn't enough, uh, there was a, a breakup of the, of the Franciscan order. 
and he had to deal with that also. And in, in that breakup, there was a, uh, a group that ultimately formed together um, a dissident group from from the church, from our understanding of the church as, as being one holy Catholic and apostolic and, and in union with, with Rome, in union with the Pope, this group uh, tried to splinter that and really are going to lead, they're going to bury a seed of dissent that will blossom time and time again as a, as a weed in the garden until it finally blossoms into the Protestant Reformation. Mm-hmm. And this really is the roots of all of this. It's, this it can be traced back this far. So the pontificate of John XXII, is, which is a long pontificate, he was pope for several, many years, um, is, is really important to our understanding of the development of church history. All right. Well, that okay. sounds very interesting. Okay. And would you close with a, a prayer and a blessing for us? Heavenly Father, source of all blessings, we turn to you this day and ask you to shower your wisdom upon us. Shower your wisdom upon our national leaders. Protect our troops and and protect all men and women in uniform who serve and protect us and who protect our liberty and protect our lives. We pray this glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was was in in the the beginning, beginning, is now, now, and shall shall be, be world world without without end. end. Amen. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.